Yeah, he's a patient uh, uh, of a diabetic retinopathy uh, who in the other eye had a fraction of some sort with a membrane but was stable and this eye had a, a subhyloid hemorrhage uh, on the macula with diabetic retinopathy changes. So, what we are going to do is go and remove the vitreous and approach the subhyloid hemorrhage and clear the blood and once we clear the blood, we will do a, a laser uh, to uh, 360 degrees to, as a PRP to regress the retinopathy. So, that is the plan uh, and then we will see if anything else is required uh, during the surgery or not. So, we will start the case uh, by putting the, the cannulas inside, the three cannulas. How do you gauge where to put your ports from the limbus based on this lens status of the patient? The previous case was a phakic eye and we took a measurement of 4 to enter. This one is pseudophakic, so we do about 3.5. And the placement is, is uh, of the upper two ports is just above the horizontal meridian. Uh, the inferior one is is about 2 to 3 clock hours below the, the horizontal meridian. One of the things we had talked about in the clinic was using anti-VEGF agents before surgery. Yes, how, yes. How, how do you make that decision? What do you look for? When do you inject? When must you operate after injecting an anti-VEGF agent? So, uh, anti-VEGF preoperative we use uh, when we see fluorid proliferations uh, which are there and it is an untreated treatment naive patient which has proliferations which we anticipate that when we operate uh, they will bleed a lot during the surgery. So, we want to reduce the chances of that bleeding. Uh, so, that is when we inject and when you ask me the timing, what we like is a difference uh, of uh, 3 days. We inject and then we wait 3 days on the 4th day if you operate it is uh, it's a good window. You can operate anytime between the 4th to 10th day. Yes sir. Uh, and you need to make sure that uh, you do operate that patient because if you don't, sometimes the, the anti vegf will lead to a sudden, uh, uh, you know, kind of fibrotic changes pulling the retina and causing more damage. You know, with the anti vegf agents, they are wonderful, but certain cases with TRDs, it can cause a contraction or a crunch, yes. which will create a tabletop yeah, yeah, detachment yeah. of the macula. It can so. lead to a crunch formation if you don't operate. But if you are operating within the 4th to 10th day, it is totally all right. Okay. Okay, so now I'm approaching the, the hemorrhage while I can see. Yes, sir. Uh, I go gradually. This is a subhyloid hemorrhage. It's a typically a boat shaped hemorrhage. Yes, So sir. what you're seeing is a patient is lying down, but if he's sitting up, you will see the boat shaped uh, hemorrhage uh, much more. And on the li it's lined by this dehemoglobinized blood around the side. So what I'll do is I'll now go into the vacuum mode and, and, and start to see if the hyloid is, is still attached here or not. So, the hyaloid is still attached and that is holding that uh, the blood. Now, I am pulling. Can you see? I am gently trying to pull and create a space there. So, this is similar to a P inducing a PVD. Uh, yeah, but here you have to be a bit careful. Uh, yes, sir. Unlike a macular hole where you can, once you have a grasp on the hyaloid, you can just pull it up. Here, uh, because there are chances of bleeding, you can do that. Because here there are proliferations which are attached to the underlying surface of the retina. You will see this hyaloid wave created. By the gross appearance of the uh, subhyaloid hemorrhage, how old has this? How long has this been there? How long do you think this blood has been settled under the hyaloid? Well, must be a month or so, not too, yeah. not too far back. Have you ever seen ghost cell glaucoma after a subhyloid hemorrhage? Have you ever seen? When have you seen no, ghost cell glaucoma uh, in retina patients? Yeah, if it's a long-standing which is hemorrhage, sometimes you can see. So now you can see that the blood is uh, more mobile because the hyaloid is gone from there. It's 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 slowly getting uh, absorbed as I take the vacuum closer to that area because previously it was trapped under the hyaloid. This is the part that we have to do carefully because you're 
is spreading very close to the retinal surface and there's a proliferation there. So do you see this bleeder here? Yes, sir. From a proliferation. So now you can see where it's oozing from. I think one of the nice things you've demonstrated during this case is the importance of visualization and yeah. being patient while we get the best visualization. Okay, so now you see this blood clot. Now, now I can see a bit better, so I'm removing it effectively. And there are a few oozers, so we will just cauterize them. I'm raising the pressure to 60 now, so that the constant bleed stops. So just to repeat what you've said, you've raised the intraocular pressure to tamponade the oozing blood vessels while you finish the case. Yes. So now the blood has totally cleared up from the macular area. Okay. So this is the disc, this is the macula, it's totally yes. free from blood now. There is a small oozer here right. and, and some here, so we will just cauterize it. After that, shift to the white field view for doing a good laser all around. So now I'm taking it close to this uh, one oozer here. You see a slight whitening effect there? Yes, sir. Okay. And you just yeah. want slight blanching as you touch Absolutely. the... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one question would be, why can you not use the endolaser to cauterize these vessels? The diathermy is way more effective in exactly. stopping the bleed. I mean, you have to use the laser in a much higher power to cauterize these. Okay, so now I'll reduce the pressure and see if the ooze comes back or not. Because here they were, the bleeder was uh, constantly oozing... So now I've reduced the pressure. Yes, sir. And I'll wait for a bit to see if it uh, rebleeds. Of course, it may slightly rebleed once I take my cutter inside and the vacuum starts coming in, but otherwise uh, it looks secure. I'll just clear up some of the residual blood which was there in the periphery because I was watching with a, I mean, a magnified view, so the field was less. Some of the spillover blood in the periphery, I'm just trying to aspirate it down. So the fovea is totally clear now. With endolaser, do you try to do a full treatment of PRP? And what are the advantages? How can you get a full treatment of endolaser PRP? Yeah, we do a 360 uh, laser treatment, which will help regress. Just like what we do externally with laser PRP, Right. we will try to achieve that uh, with our surgery. I think one of the nice things, I mean, you've demonstrated a lot at this case, being gentle with the tissue, making sure you have good visualization. Can you just tell us why you're doing an air fluid exchange on this patient? Yes, so air fluid exchange, uh, I basically do uh, at the end of all my vitrectomies is mainly to have an air bubble. It's a partial exchange that I would do. It's mainly to have the, the wounds secure uh, because the sutureless vitrectomies, uh, the liquid vitreous tends to, I mean, once you have saline inside, the wounds can be a bit leaky.